Hey model builders and lost YouTube surfers, welcome to The Model Guy and the first episode of the series for the 132 Tamiya Corsair. This model kit is pretty much perfect so there's not too much I can tell you for build flaws to run into, but I can show you a few tricks and tips that I have that can improve the kit with very little effort. There are some big names out there in the aftermarket world offering resin upgrades for this cockpit and in reality you don't really need them. Tamiya has nailed the production of this and with just using some soldering wire and super glue and different gauges, you can put yourself together a very busy cockpit with some cables, pipes, hydraulic lines, whatever comes to mind. The beauty of using black super glue is afterwards you can clean it up with some debonder and really clean things up. One big tip I do have for you though, should you choose to go this route, is to make sure you test fit things before you start jamming some wires behind them. Because Tamiya's engineering is very tight, and things like uncleaned sprue gates, or even some paint in joining areas, may affect the overall fit of the kit. So, make sure you test fit before committing to glue. The office for the Corsair is quite large and very visible, even with the sides of the model put together in the canopy in place. So it's a great area if you want to do some weathering and really put some time and effort in there to make it pop. One of the very first steps to weathering that I do if I want some chipping is usually put down a silver lacquer paint as the base. This does a great job of simulating the aluminum that is under the paint of certain cockpit components. Once all the areas that are going to be chipped are covered in silver paint, I cover it with a few thin layers of AK heavy chipping fluid. You can also use hairspray, which seems to be the more common medium that people use for this. Once that silver paint was down, it's time to move on to the color basing. And normally if you're using a medium or a light color, that silver paint's really gonna be a problem and keep shining through your color. But because I'm using interior green and working from dark to light for the color basing, I start with Tamiya's NATO green, which is quite dark and covers that silver quite well. With the NATO green down for the base of the color basing slash black basing, I then come in with a super light color like the Tamiya Sky. And this is going to start laying down the foundation for the top coat. So by having a dark color and a light color, you can really control how worn your paint looks with the final blend layer. You don't have to stop at just a dark and a light tone either. You can also come in with a totally different color to really change what that final blend layer is going to do and the severity of your weathering. Zinc chromate yellow, great to use with greens. The final step of color basing slash black basing, whatever you want to call it, is to start blending all these tones together. And to do that, I'm just using a thinned down paint and just adding layers. The more layers you add, the less tone variation you're going to have. If you really want to get crazy, you can use a lightened layer just to add some false lighting in the cockpit, just to add a more dramatic effect. With all the base colors down, it's now time to move on to the chipping. And the nice thing about lacquer paints is they're hard to chip, but it gives you a more legitimate look once it does start to chip away and flake. My goal is to have this aircraft look heavily weathered and there are going to be quite a few purists who are not going to be a fan of this, but at the end of the series I'll explain why I did it the way I did, and I'm sure you'll be entertained. It's also in response to a question that the Plastic Posse podcast had put out in one of their great discussions. If you haven't been listening to the Plastic Posse podcast, you've kind of been missing out because it's a great podcast, it's very engaging, and they have some fantastic guests on there to talk about the things they do and why they do them. Just like the seat and rear bulkhead, I also did some shading on the instrument panel just to add in some more contrast. Cockpits can be very dark, so the more light you can get in there, or make appear to be in there, the more interesting it'll be. The main reason that I like using acrylic paints for the detail painting on top of the lacquer base paints is because if I make a mistake, I can just come in with a little bit of acrylic thinner or water and simply wipe that away, and I won't have to worry about the colors underneath reacting. Dry brushing is another one of those techniques that can make your model pop, but it is very easy to overdo. The best way I find to do this is to offload 
as much of the paint as I can until it's almost leaving no trace behind, and then I can slowly build the effect up. Any time that something takes you a while to build up, you have to remember that it's also giving you a lot more control over it. By highlighting the edges of the radios with a silver color, it really exaggerates that these are made of metal and makes them look heavier in my opinion. And a lot more authentic. What you should notice here is that when I'm dry brushing, I'm not smacking the brush into the part or heavily applying it. I'm just lightly passing over to the point where the brush barely touches anything. And that gives you a lot of control over this technique. My goal in the end is to really catch the edges of panels where they come together. And if I make a mistake and feel that the dials are too heavily dry brushed, I can always come back in and repaint those with a brush. To me, it does give you some great reference photos in this kit, but those reference photos are from a variety of aircraft from 1Ds, British Navy, American Navy, and you really have to be careful because as great as to me it is with the research and development of the kit, sometimes their color callouts are not exactly accurate. And the biggest one I can think of isn't even for an American kit, it's for a Japanese kit. They tell you that the cowling and the area behind the cockpit of the Zero are black, when in reality there is a definite blue tint to those colors. I'm not sure who does the research for that, but if that's the only thing to me is doing wrong, I can totally forgive them because that's not a hard thing to fix at all. Some of these highlights may seem very harsh right now, but you have to remember you're going to come in with some oils and some pin washes, and that's really going to reduce that effect. One of the biggest things I've found with modeling is to really trust the process because a lot of the time I would start to get nervous and start to push those contrasts back quite a bit. And then when I came in with the oils and washes and all that fun stuff, the effect was pretty much gone. So this is one of the first builds where I really pushed the contrast as much as I could and really trusted I knew where I was going. Or at least hoped that if I screwed up badly enough, no one would really notice. The last time I built the 132 Corsair, I bought an aftermarket instrument panel for it, but I kind of noticed in the end that the cowling covered that and you really couldn't see any of it. So this time around, I decided to save the money and because the Tamiya decals were on the back part of clear sprue, the thickness wouldn't be a problem. So everything else in the cockpit was the Barracuda Studios decals, except for the instrument panel itself. These decals are fantastic and if you put optivisors on, you can actually read the writing on most of them. I'm not sure if it's because the decals looked too new or too white for the instrument gauges, so I ended up firing a yellow tint over top of them just to make them look more aged and worn. And with that complete, it was time to move on to the weathering stage with some pin washes. Pin washes are again one of those things that force a lot of contrast or a stage makeup effect on parts. One thing I've noticed recently is that just using blacks and browns can sometimes be too harsh or overpowering. So I've been trying to use colors that match the tones they're going over top of. So for the cockpit green, I end up using Absalom's Field Gray, which is a very dark green, and turning that into a wash with some thinner. And that actually looked a lot more natural and better than the black on the last time around. I always use a brush to put on my washes just to make sure it's more controlled and going into the areas I want. And that also makes cleanup a lot easier as well. Once I hit the cockpit panels with a black pin wash, I ended up coming in again with the AK's landing gear wash just to make it look more dusty. And I actually really like that wash because it's easy to remove and it's also very easy to build up and really enhance the effects. The nice thing about oils on top of a lacquer paint is they're very easy to remove or blend if you're not happy with how they look. And after I had this wash on, I just came in with a stippling brush and started blending it a bit more. One thing I know people are going to comment on as soon as they see it is the orange flare gun. Now, the kit calls out for a black flare gun, and when I started searching for World War II flare guns, I found a few orange ones, so I thought that was interesting. It would add kind of something that would draw your eye in the cockpit. To try to make this headrest look more like leather and more worn, the oils once again came into play. 
Once all this was done, however, the kit ended up sitting for three weeks while I waited for seatbelts from HGW to arrive. I thought I'd already ordered them and had them on hand, but it turns out I didn't. So while I was waiting for those to arrive, I ended up working on the undercarriage, building some hydraulic systems, all that fun stuff. But we'll get to that in the next video. For putting aftermarket seatbelts in your aircraft, there's really only one company that really nails it, and that's HGW. And that's because they're using a fabric to simulate a fabric. Rather than trying to bend this or even anneal it and repaint it, it's just a matter of running the fabric through the buckle. But that sometimes is a lot easier said than done, and you can spend a little bit of time doing this. I've done this one other time in 124 scale, but this is the next one down. When you're building HGW belts, they're not difficult. They're just something that you really have to pay attention to what you're doing. And I would highly recommend putting on your Optivisors to do this. You might think 132 is a large scale, but when you're sitting there trying to run these through the buckles, you find out how small they actually are. I've got big mechanic sausage hands. I'm not really used to doing this finesse stuff. But in the end, the seat belts cannot be beat, and I really love them. So yes, I'll use them again and endure all that because in the end, it is definitely worth it. And that's going to bring this video to a close. Make sure you click like and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you're interested in more content going on with the channel, join my patrons here and sign up. They're getting access to silhouette mask files, 3D printing files, and they're also getting some updates behind the scenes for what's coming next. And week early and 24 hour early ad free videos. This is the Model Guy and I'll see you next time.